Chicken, chicken, chicken and chicken. This chicken though is a little bit different. It was grown in a lab. This year, the US became the second country in the world behind Singapore to make it legal to sell and eat this stuff. Some people are skeptical, others are excited. But what I wanna know is how is it made and will we ever get to eat it here in Australia? Lab-grown chicken has cracked the US consumer market. You're making chicken in there. Yeah, it's been heralded as the start of a new era and there's little doubt that it's that. So lab-grown meat is meat that's grown in a laboratory, like by definition. This is Molly. She works for Magic Valley, a cultured meat company in Melbourne. Um, so it's made from taking a really small skin sample from animals. So it's pain-free, doesn't harm the animal. The animals are fine afterwards. And we take those skin cells and we reprogram them into stem cells. The stem cells are then put into a liquid food mixture made up of amino acids, glucose and other nutrients in huge metal tanks like these, where they can then be grown into all sorts of things. From muscle cells to fat, the stem cells are like the blueprint for building all of it. How long does it go from that, the start of that process all the way to making a dumpling or a burger? Um, so essentially, when we start with the skin sample from an animal, so it takes about three months to make a induced pluripotent stem cell line. But once we have that cell line, we have that forever. And it takes about three weeks to grow a patty, like a burger patty from that cell line. How big does this sample need to be? Like tiny, tiny, tiny. Not slaughtering the animal is a big draw card of lab-grown meat. Once these companies have a stem cell line that they're happy with, they can theoretically grow endless amounts of meat from it. And because you don't need much of the animal to begin with, some people have been doing pretty weird things in this space. Another Australian lab-grown meat company, Vow, recently unleashed this upon the world the mammoth meatball. Not in my wildest dreams did I expect to get the kind of reception that we managed to get with the mammoth meatball. That's James, Vow's chief scientific officer. The mammoth meatball was made by injecting synthesised mammoth DNA, which used some elephant DNA to help fill in the gaps, into sheep stem cells. Cultured meat, we often talk about cultured meat as being something that doesn't involve the killing of animals. The ultimate way to prove that is to create something from an extinct animal, right? Because the extinct animal is already dead, uh, there's no way for you to kill that animal. So um, that, that was really attractive to us. But there's a catch. None of this has been approved for human consumption here in Australia, yet. That's where the Food Standards Authority comes in. Hi everybody, I'm Glenn Neal. I'm the general manager of our risk management branch here at Food Standards Australia, New Zealand. We make food standards for, for both countries. Can you tell us a bit about that process? How does something go from an idea to in a restaurant or store shelves? Yeah, great question. So we, we get about um, somewhere in the region 20 to 30 applications a year, so not a, not a huge number. And each one tends to take around nine to 12 months. So from start to finish, um, you know, a, a good part of that time is us doing the scientific investigation and then um, you know, we'll put it out to the public for four to six weeks. All that um, yeah, it does tend to take a bit of time. Another problem Glenn's team at Fasans has to work out is labelling. At the moment if you walk into the shops you'll see milk that comes from cows alongside milk that comes from oats, soybeans or rice. Think about peanut butter for example. Oh yeah, peanut yeah. peanut butter ain't butter. It's it's <laughs> it's it's peanuts plus oil. There's no butter in peanut butter, right? If we're going to get too pernickety about it, if I could use the word pernickety, probably not too many Australian high school students would know what the word per pernickety means. If we're going to get too fussy about it, um, you know, where do we go with hot dogs? Do we allow hot dogs to be called hot dogs? There's no not too much dog, uh, hopefully, in a hot dog. So you know, is that is that misleading people as well? What about a Kit Kat? How far do we go here? We're starting with cells from the animal, um, that, so it is, it is real meat, real animal meat. We're just only growing the bits that we want to eat. It's important, I think, that people uh, understand what it is they're buying, that they make an informed choice, that they, and they're not misled uh, into thinking they're buying, for example, a conventionally um, raised uh, meat product, for example. So there shouldn't be any confusion with the labelling of these products. 
It might not be conventionally raised, but this meat is designed to have less impact on the environment and use fewer resources, and that has huge appeal to lots of people. There's a, a sector of society who believe that animal agriculture is, is, a, is a key uh, source of greenhouse gases and um, they think that uh, in order to defeat climate change or to bring about or slow climate change that we need to uh, change the way we, um, we feed ourselves essentially. But that could take a while. For now, the only way to taste one of these lab-grown meat products is to either be working at one of these lab-grown meat companies or be pretty notable. If you have a million dollars in your pocket, yeah, sure. Come right. Ooh, that actually, that's a really good point. How much does it cost to do one of these tastings? This is Wendy, Magic Valley's internal chef and researcher. Nothing. No, no. So these are all invited guests. So no, there's no cost to invite the guests yet. Okay. So, so you have to be part of like a special guest list at the moment to get to taste these. VIP list, yes. VIP list, yeah. Um, does it cost you a lot of money to feed your VIP guests? Like what's the cost of a, um, a serve of dumplings or a, or a burger patty? All right, at the start uh, for research and development, it was expensive. Uh, but at the moment, uh, the cost of a patty is about $5. And uh, we expect the cost will come down with more um, optimization. So far, there's been one application received by the Food Standards Authority from the folks that made the mammoth meatball for cultured quail meat, not mammoth. Our first product is going to be quail. Why would you use this brand new technology to simply replicate something that you can already buy today? Consumers know exactly what chicken tastes like, so you have to make sure that you hit it absolutely on the head, because if you don't, a consumer is going to say, yeah, look, it tastes pretty good, but it tastes different. And the second someone says the word different, you're in trouble. Now, quail is a, um, a really nice species because it's not it's not something most consumers can immediately think about, oh, this doesn't taste like the quail I ate yesterday. And so quail sort of fits in this nice, um, that sort of uh, uh, happy medium of it's different, but not too different. We have received our first application. Uh, pretty exciting after a, a reading about these things for a number of years. We're busy working our way through that at the moment actually and we expect to uh, get to public consultation on that in the next couple of months. So that should be an interesting process and we look forward to uh, seeing what everybody has to say about that when we go out and consult. So in Australia and New Zealand at least, it's possible that we might start to see lab-grown meat on shelves sooner rather than later.